Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've already welcomed uh, the, the, the general who was responsible for the protection of Camp Ashraf. Thank you. Thank you. Hanun Lady Corbett, Azin K, Manara Davat, Kardid Mood Shah Karam. <laughs> Distinguished guests, family and friends of those at Camp Ashraf, I'm honored to be with you today. I must say, with that introduction that you gave me, remember, I carry a heavy burden because I was part in charge of consolidating the people at Ashraf, working the disarmament. I spent over three decades on active duty with the United States Army. I was there when the people of Ashraf consolidated from all of the facilities across Iraq in 2003. I was there when they voluntarily disarmed. Sure, we did fingerprints and photos too. We then brought in a team from across the coalition forces, from the UK too, and we investigated over 3,000, every single member that was there. And there's been allegations that they want to leave Camp Ashraf. Well, we took every single member off of Camp Ashraf. The United Nations doesn't say this very often. We took them up north in Diyala province and individually gave them that opportunity. Do you want to leave? Well, I can tell you, out of over 3,800 at the time, we had smaller than a handful who wanted to leave, and most was because of medical issues of their family at other places. They voluntarily went back. And we did the investigations into them. And do you know what we found? And I was waiting. I wanted a smoking gun to justify why we are treating these people this way. Why we are putting them in a camp with no due process. And when the FBI senior agent came back in, what he told me was, we're going home, we're done. So, yeah, and, and? He goes, Nothing. There's not one allegation of credible evidence against any of the over 3,800 members at Camp Ashraf. So have fun. <laughs> then allegations of torture, imprisonment, and hidden weapons were coming into us. I had free reign to that camp. So at 2 in the morning or 4 in the afternoon, we would run operations and raid facilities. No weapons, no ammunition. There was no torture ever going on. And we definitely didn't find anyone imprisoned. It was all false propaganda being fed in from the Iranian regime trying to get us to believe the fact that they were truly terrorists. Well, that is the only place in the country of Iraq and I have to tell you, I was in al-Maliki's office with General Petraeus on numerous occasions, and I was armed. But when I was with the people of Camp Ashraf, my weapon hung back in my Humvee, because I didn't need to be armed. <laughs> it was a tough go. I had to live with all of that because after that investigation, we, those of us that were responsible for the protection of Camp Ashraf, were told, nope, they are protected persons under the Fourth Geneva Convention. I was very proud of the unit I commanded, the 89th Military Police Brigade. Every one of you has walked past that proud uh, patch that we all wore on our sleeves and may not even realize it. I was so proud of the organization and I felt so strong about the promise that my country had given them that I put the patch of my unit on the card of every single member of the people at Camp Ashraf, and they're on the wall back there, right here. This card here, 
I put the patch of my unit and it says protected person. Has their identification, their photo and phone numbers to contact if any issues ever happen. Unfortunately, the pictures on the cards hanging in the back and these two here, they were not protected very well because they were killed by Iraqis and gunned down about this past April. I'm still here talking about this because that's my unit's patch. There were American soldiers who died wearing that patch protecting the people at Ashraf. And what did we do to them? We abandoned them. What part of promise isn't understood on that? Over 5,000 U.S. soldiers and some of the Allied and Coalition soldiers worked at Ashraf during the time that we were there from 2003 to 2009. Have you ever heard one of them make any comment about the terrorists there? They all are still shaking their head, many contacting me, telling me, go on, General, keep going, because what were we doing? It's ridiculous. We abandoned them. And now we are standing watching. Camp Liberty was turned over to the Iraqis in working order. The generators were operational. The air conditioners worked in all the facilities. We left fuel in the fuel pods to run those generators. But then I started getting phone calls from many of my Iraqi contacts. And I worked with the Iraqis for many years. And a vast majority are wonderful people who care about their country. And they're watching it getting hijacked by another tyrant. Some very senior leaders told me, General Phillips, my friend, Camp Liberty is not what you remember. It's been looted, vandalized, and the place they want to put the people of Ashraf is horrid, under horrible conditions. In discussions with some of my Iraqi friends, the term gulag came up. Also, concentration camp. Well, recently, one of my Iraqi friends called because he cares about his country and said, we do not want the term Camp Liberty to be synonymous with Buchenwald and Dachau, but it's headed that way. The people at Ashraf saw this notebook because I carried it everywhere and I was making notes all the time. Well, I never believed I would have to pull out a document out of that notebook and show the world this is the Camp Liberty, the concentration camp that 397 people from Camp Ashraf are now forced to live in. There was an MOU that was signed by the United Nations that this was not the case. 23 senior leaders, including myself, petitioned to go to Iraq to inspect Camp Liberty at our own cost. We were turned down. The Iraqis didn't want us inspecting it. What were they hiding behind those 18-foot concrete walls? Well, we now know. I contacted Ambassador Kobler multiple times. I laid my credentials on the line. I know what it takes to run a camp with 4,000 soldiers. I would come over there, I offered to assist him. I am good friends with many of the Iraqi leaders, the ones whose hearts are bleeding because of what they are watching happen to their country and these people at Ashraf. I have good contacts with them. I have good contacts with the people at Ashraf and I could do your job, Ambassador Kobler, and you could take the credit. I'll do it at my cost. He refuses to return my emails or phone calls. If you're afraid, Ambassador Kobler, I'll send my daughter over. She'll cover it down for you. You can stay behind your walls where you're staying at. I'll go over there tomorrow and get on a flight and fly down to Baghdad and go there and check it at my own cost. I have my wife's approval to do this because we want to have eyes on. The Iraqis want us to see what's going on there. They want us to validate it. 
so that El Maliki and his other puppets and henchmen cannot cause another massacre. Let me tell you, I saw the people of Camp Ashraf create an oasis in the desert. But they, no one, no one on this earth is going to be able to create a humane condition out of sewage. And that's what's on the other side of those walls. So if I could be any place in the world tomorrow, any place, where would I be? It would be fulfilling a promise I gave to those people. It would be going back to Ashraf and saying, I'm back. And doggone it, we're going to protect you because we promised we're going to protect you. It's about time my government delisted you and did the right thing, what we told you we were going to do. We will protect you when you turn in your weapons. Thank you. <laughs>